Chapter 1121 Forest of a Thousand Insects In the future, Hansen was surprised, and it seemed as if Bao wanted that vine even more than he had thought. Considering her words, he decided against finishing off the fish king. Killing super creatures was no longer a monumental task for Hansen, so it was worth putting this one aside if it meant keeping Bauer happy. Hansen was interested in the monster with the vines, though. If the fish king could help with this situation, then it would be worth keeping. Hansen simulated the silver fox's lightning and tried to heal the fish king. But the Dongshin Sutra did not have a sufficient number of gene locks open, rendering the healing Hansen could impart almost completely useless. The lightning didn't work very well on a creature as strong as that. After half a day of healing, Hansen was knackered. And despite his efforts, the fish had only healed a tiny amount. This must be a berserk super creature. Up close and personal with the fish, Hansen could now get a real feel for how powerful the fish king was. It being a berserk variant was likely. The fish king was looking better, though. It was now able to move. It turned to look at the mountain, and it seemed as if it wished to return but it couldn't, and it looked regretful for knowing that, too. It turned away from Hansen and Bauer and swam away downstream. Bauer looked disappointed. Hansen was standing on top of the fish king, holding Bauer in his hands. As they were carried along, Hansen remained deep in thought over the connection that may have existed between Bauer and the vine. The fish king swam for another half day, and eventually, they encountered Queen. Queen was taken aback when she saw the fish, which had none of its scales left. Hansen put away Golden Growler and invited her to come sit on the fish alongside him. He told her about what had transpired in the time he had been away, but made no mention of the possible connection to Bauer. So much of what happened is mysterious and inexplicable. If the fish king was willing to die for it, it can only mean the vine is extremely valuable, Queen said. Hansen nodded. He really wanted to find out more, but he acknowledged he was too weak to find out in his current state. He hoped he could somehow get the fish king to return, fight, and beat the vine. After traveling for a while longer, the fish king met up with its legion of lantern fish. When it reached them, they swarmed around to kiss its wounds. With each kiss from a lantern fish, a mode of light would depart their lips and soak into the fish king's body. Miraculously, the fish king's life force immediately began to replenish. More and more lantern fish offered their moats to the fish king, and as this continued to occur, the scales began to sprout back and armor up the fish king once again. After seeing this, Hansen was ready to hit the road and return to the mountain. But, Bao stopped him and said, Daddy, it will take us. Take us? Take us where? Hansen asked. It saw someone who looked like us, Bauer said. Hansen looked at Queen. If the fish had seen other humans, it meant they could be taken to a human shelter. If that was true, that would be great news. The fish recovered and swam quickly downstream. After just under a day of travel, the fish king stopped and skirted a bank of the river. When Hansen looked at where they had come to, he was shocked. There were thorny vines wreathed around the ordinary forest flora. Wherever they were, they couldn't be too far from Thorn Forest. They disembarked the fish king and looked back at it. It shook its tail as if to wave goodbye, and then took off swimming. Bauer, how do we find the fish again? Hansen looked at the river. It was a large river, but not in the grander scheme of the land. Finding where they had come from would be difficult. It will go there, Bawa said, as she looked off in the direction of the mountain. For now, there was nothing Hansen could do. Even with his super king spirit mode, he could not do battle with the vine beast and expect victory. Fortunately, the vine beast did seem to have one limitation. It never seemed to leave the lofty peak it resided upon. If it truly was afraid to come down, that was good for them. Hansen shuddered to think of what might have happened if it had followed them down. When I get stronger, I'll go back for that vine, Hansen thought to himself as he walked towards the forest. Eventually, they came across human footprints. That told Hansen humans had to be around. Someplace. After ten miles of walking, the trio stumbled across a castle, nestled between the trees. There, he could see humans fighting creatures. Friends, where have you come from? Someone asked Hansen and Queen. Our shelter is someplace nearby, but we are lost, Hansen answered dubiously, wanting to test their intent. You are lucky then. Venturing through this treacherous forest alone is no small feat. You are fortunate to be breathing, the man exclaimed, with genuine surprise. Hansen was delighted to hear his words, as it meant Thorn Forest must have been around. The forest they were currently in 
as Hansen later learned, was called the Forest of a Thousand Insects. It was a forest that neighbored Thorn Forest. The wide rivers bordered one length of this forest, which was nice. But what was even better was that there was only one royal shelter in the vicinity. The humans lived inside it, but Hansen could not guess why it had been empty when they found it. Thorn Forest and the rivers were said to be dangerous, but the forest of a thousand insects wasn't. It was primarily populated by ordinary, primitive, and mutant creatures. The humans were fortunate to live there. After the trio entered the shelter, they were warmly welcomed. There was much joy to see, and the humans all seemed to live in harmony with each other. Everyone aided everyone else, and there seemed to be no conflict, competition, or strife. Hansen and Queen decided to remain there for a short while, and in the meantime, Hansen returned to the Alliance and pinpointed exactly where he was. Perhaps it would be possible for him to move the underground shelter. Since that location was not too far from the river, and the river led to the Vine Beast, Hansen planned to remain in that forest for quite some time. Chapter 1122 Meeting the Creature from the Nest Again Hansen returned to the Alliance and used what little information he had to figure out where he was in the grander scale of the Third God Sanctuary. Hansen stayed at the shelter for a while, and when he figured out where he was, he asked Moment Queen to move the shelter close to them. Unfortunately, the underground shelter could only move a certain distance with each teleportation. It would take a month for it to reach Han Sr. The shelter they were at was called Nest. There were around 40 people living there, with the population spread across a vast manner of different ages. The eldest among the people were over 100 years old. The area around it was rather safe, and any surpasser that came to be there was guaranteed a good life. The people at the shelter said only five people had died there in over a hundred years. Two of them died while venturing into a creature's nest, whereas the others died while trying to brave either Thorn Forest or the waters. Hansen was surprised to learn there was a nest there, and Uncle Bug told him this nest was in the very center of the forest. No one dared to go there, and on the few occasions that they had snuck in, the eggs inside the nest had proven too sturdy for them to break. Uncle Bug was the leader of the shelter. He was the oldest there, and he was the founder of the shelter. As such, he had the authority of leadership. He didn't focus too much on himself, and he was always more concerned with helping others. Whenever someone new arrived, he'd make sure to provide them with beast souls to begin or aid them in their time in the third god's sanctuary. Having a leg up, and having the proper equipment to deal with creatures of that realm right from the start, was an invaluable and much appreciated boon. He was titled, Uncle, out of respect. His age meant nothing to the people of the shelter. He was a good man. The reason he had the name Bug was because of the beast souls he usually gave out. He loved handing out beast souls, but they were always some sort of bug. And on a day-to-day -day basis, he had a dozen bug beast souls all around him, too. As for what Uncle Bug's real name was, none knew. The new people who came to the shelter would always receive a bug pet beast soul as a welcome. They weren't powerful, but they were a worthy aid for newbies when fighting ordinary creatures. When Hansen and Uncle Bug saw each other for the first time, Uncle Bug looked at him strangely. He was sensitive enough to tell that Hansen studied both the Dongshin Sutra and Jade Skin. Hansen initially believed Uncle Bug's peculiar reaction at their meeting was because the man had recognized him. When considering Hansen's past glories, it wasn't too far-fetched to believe he was a recognizable face, after all. He was once a household name of the Alliance. People still believed he was sick, though so it would catch anyone off guard to see him frolicking about the forest of the Third God Sanctuary. Uncle Bug was very nice. He took Hansen and Queen on a tour of the area around the shelter, informing them both about the forest. When he was done, he provided them both bugs. When Queen learned of Hansen's intention to remain there, she decided to go out on a hunt. Hansen, in the meantime, decided to visit the center of the forest of a thousand insects. For most surpassers, such a place was deadly. For Hansen, it was a trove of goodies he could easily plunder. If the eggs inside there were super creatures, it was sure to be a wonder. What Hansen currently needed most were super genes. He wasn't particularly interested in anything else, so he just flew straight for the center. While traveling through the air, Hansen caught sight of a mountain peak in the distance. It was like a blooming lotus flower, the top of which looked like an entrance. He guessed it was the entry to the nest. Hansen flew there and saw an abundance of bugs, all possessing gold shells. Like beetles, they all had shiny gold horns. 
Their claws were like saws, too. There had to be at least a hundred of the critters. At the most, they looked to be mutant creatures. Therefore, Hansen was too lazy to kill them. Traveling to the center of the mountain, he found a cave. It was the entrance to the nest. Hansen looked inside and noticed the surprising absence of creatures. He put on his Supermanus armor and summoned Disloyal Knight. Disloyal Knight entered first, but the path was clear of creatures for its entire length. They approached a crystal wall, and they found it already broken. Someone had been there before them. Hansen looked around and saw no creatures or living things in the area around them. Under the green light of the shattered crystals, Hansen noticed the presence of many broken bug shells. They weren't in the best condition, and they looked as if they had been ripped and torn off the creatures they may have once belonged to. Some were bigger than train cars, others were as small as one's fist. They were everywhere in that cave. This is a strange place. Has someone come here and killed all the creatures? Hansen thought to himself. People said two had come to this place before. One died inside, while the other escaped but eventually died, anyway. Hansen did not expect a duo such as that would have what it took to kill so many creatures, large and small. Perhaps someone else had come to this place before Hansen had. Hansen was disappointed. He feared the eggs further inside would already be broken. If they had, this entire venture would have been a waste of time. Since he was there already, though, he kept exploring. And he wouldn't turn back unless he could confirm the condition of the eggs that were said to reside there. He continued on. The bug shells were everywhere, and Hansen couldn't help but frown when seeing them. Chapter 1123, Metal Cart The broken shells were strange to see. They did not look as if they had been removed from the creatures with a fine weapon. The whole cave was littered with the shells, and there was not a single living thing to be found. When Hansen reached the deepest recess of the cave, he was dismayed to learn there was nothing there. No eggs. Nothing. Who could have done all this and broken the eggs? Is this the work of a human or a spirit? Hansen frowned. It was pointless to wonder now, though. But just as Hansen readied himself to depart, he was overwhelmed with a chill that suggested he was in immediate danger. He turned around and threw a punch without thinking. The gauntlets collided with a dark green claw, and when they met, the force sent him flying backwards. As he careened through the cavern, he broke through many crystal walls. Disloyal Knight ran to the monster to engage it, providing time for Hansen to stand up. The pain he was feeling was excruciating, but he knew he did not have the time to wallow around. When his eyes focused, he was shocked to see Disloyal Knight in conflict with a dark green spider. It was the size of a household room, and it was hairy. Disloyal Knight threw a punch, but before it could land, the spider fired a web to tangle and nullify its potential damage. Disloyal Knight was strong, but the web was far too sticky for him to do anything against it. The web was like a million, syrupy rubber bands. The web knotted its way around Disloyal Knight's arm, and the spider continued to unleash stream after stream of the web. Eventually, Disloyal Knight was practically cocooned. He had been rendered unable to move. Pang. The metallic claws of the spider struck against Disloyal Knight's armor and left a deep cleft across his chest. With its foe trapped and unable to move, the spider made the most of this opportunity to keep attacking. Hansen now knew what the shells were. They were the shells of bugs that had been killed by the spider. The meat of the prey had all been eaten, leaving behind the ruined remains of a husk. That's what the tattered shells were. This spider must have been birthed from the egg that was said to be here. What a horrifying creature to murder and dine on so many hapless victims. It makes me shudder. Hansen was strangely excited about this ordeal. The eggs had not been taken, and neither had they been eaten. They had become a super creature. Hansen summoned his gold raven beast soul and transformed. With his blood pulse sutra, he activated his nine gene locks. The spider, seeing this other threat, then turned to fire webs at Hans' senator. They were hopeless against him, though as the webs were immediately incinerated by the bird's fire. Hansen swooped in close to the spider, and with his talons, he cut the spider with a grisly swing. Immediately, the spider began to gush green blood. Hansen then spun around and fired a geyser of flame towards Disloyal Knight to free him. The trapping web was scorched away, freeing him to do combat once again. Following this, Hansen and the knight cooperated in attacking the spider. With Disloyal Knight's Halo and Hans Sin's volcanic assaults, the spider stood no chance. There was no place for the spider to run or hide inside the cave. And within the hour, Hans Sin was able to deliver the final blow.
crushing its brain. Super creature cruel spider king killed. No beast soul gained. The flesh of this creature is inedible, but you may harvest its life geno essence. Consume its life geno essence to gain 0 to 10 super geno points randomly. Although there was no beast soul, Hansen was still pleased with the result. He did not expect to receive a life geno essence again, quite so soon. When the body decomposed, though, something else was left behind. It wasn't just the life geno essence this time. Hansen's jaw dropped when he saw what it was. It was a gold card, one emblazoned with the nine life cat emblem. The card was red and around the size of a man's hand. On its back was the number seven. Hansen examined it closely, but could not learn anything more. He had no clue why it had been left there, inside the belly of that spider. He took the life geno essence and walked around, wanting to ensure he had not missed anything. Hansen eventually returned to Nest Shelter and asked Uncle Bug a few questions. The answers he received were disappointing. The scariest place in the region was the nest he had just been to. Aside from Thorn Forest and the water, is there anywhere else strange and treacherous I might venture? Hansen asked. Hansen did not want to go to the water. The last time he was there, the Fish King made all the creatures run off. In case he needed to traverse the banks of those wide rivers again in the near future, the last thing he wanted to do was provoke the kind inhabitants that had once respectfully provided him passage. Thorn Forest was a mysterious place. It was wild and unpredictable, so without the safety net of his underground shelter, he wouldn't dare venture there. There is still one more peculiar spot, here in the Forest of a Thousand Insects, Uncle Bug said. What place would that be? Hansen asked. Uncle Bug remained silent for a few moments, before telling Hansen, there are three small hills that skirt Thorn Forest. They're around 500 meters tall, with a valley between them that is completely devoid of life. One dead spot, surrounded by the abundance of vegetation everywhere else in this land. Creatures have been known to wander in, but never wander out. And occasionally, you can hear the distant voice of a baby crying. Uncle Bug went on to say, I've been here all these years, and never once wanted to set foot in that place. What you might find there, I haven't a clue. But for what it's worth, I would advise against traveling there. Hansen feigned agreement but secretly thought to himself, this is exactly what I wanted. Hansen asked where that place was, so he knew where to avoid. His next trip was set. Chapter 1124, Dongshjin Sutra's Fifth Tier Hansen had managed to collect three life geno essences by this point, but none had been fully absorbed. I need to get my asterisk SS in gear. Otherwise, I won't be able to absorb it. Hansen thought about buying a geno fluid to help synthesize and speed up the absorption process. He was tempted, but he ultimately chose not to. Firstly, it was too expensive. Secondly, he did not know whether or not there were any unwanted side effects that had yet to come to light. Before going to the strange valley that he had been told about, Hansen decided to open his fifth gene lock first. He had opened the Dongshan Sutra's fourth gene lock a long time ago but he had held off on opening more due to his injury. One had been opened by Big Mara, but he had managed to shut it down and close it. So, for now, Hansen focused on his Dongshan Sutra. His fitness was sufficient to support the fifth gene lock being open, and since it had been opened once before, it was an easy and smooth process to open it again properly. The moment he opened the fifth gene lock, his head felt as if something inside it had snapped. The radius of his Dongshan aura had not increased but he felt different with it. Hansen could sense a lot of things inside that aura with his seventh sense. But that was before. Now, his sensitivities had widely increased. He had the eighth sense. Now, when he was scanning someone, he could get a feel for what they were thinking. He used his Dongshan aura and scanned the area around him. There was a guy called Wang Lin there, and he was currently busy slicing up the carcass of a creature. He wasn't speaking at all, but Hansen could sense what he was saying to himself with his mind voice. After I eat this mutant flesh, my geno point tally will reach 76. Hansen didn't think it was possible to do this, but he knew it was impossible for him to guess something so detailed. He thought his Dongshan aura was somehow lifting the signals of their brain. Hansen scanned the others and realized he was correct. Xiaomei is a slut. I almost broke my back last night. I'll have to remedy it with some oil later for round two tonight. I'm going to F asterisk CK her to death. Where should I go to kill creatures? Killing worms is too dangerous, but killing bugs is too simple and lame. F asterisk CK. 
That asterisk surely tricked me. I'm going to F asterisk CK him up the next time I see him. When he focused on a person inside the aura, Hansen could read their minds in real time. He could also get a perfect sense of how someone was feeling inside. Can I hear the thoughts of creatures? Hansen focused on Bauer, who was currently scarfing down some grub. Unfortunately, Hansen was unable to hear a single thing. Instead, he turned his attention to the bird that was sitting on Bauer's shoulder. Much to his surprise, he was able to discern its thoughts. She never shares any food with me. What a b asterisk tch. Hansen was incredibly excited over this new ability, and he was giddy to try it out on everything he could. He ran straight into the forest to hear the thoughts of all the creatures he could find. Eat. 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 Hungry. 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 Hansen noticed most other creatures were simple-minded. Hansen now had a better understanding of what the fifth gene lock provided. He could hear the thoughts of others, but only if their feelings were strong and at the forefront of their minds. The stronger their thoughts, the clearer Hansen could hear them. Hansen thought about the long-term viability and usefulness of the power, as most super creatures had the eighth sense. That meant there was no use trying to hide from their seventh sense. This skill didn't have a clear purpose, so Hansen was unsure what to make of it. It enabled Hansen to simulate energy flows with greater efficiency, though, so at least the refinement of life geno essences was faster. If I have nine tears, does that mean I'll be able to read anyone's mind with crystal clarity? Hansen wondered to himself. The Dongshen Sutra meant you could see through things, even that which was in heaven. The thoughts of all humans could definitely be read. Hansen would have liked to open the ninth tier then and there, but there were no shortcuts available. Hansen went back to the shelter, walking right past Uncle Buck. Hansen focused on him, and he heard a shouting voice boom inside his head. No way is he Han Jingji's heir. But why does he claim that his grandpa is Han Jingji? And why does he have the Nine Life Cat on him? Hansen heard this and felt a shiver run down his spine. Uncle Bug knew about his family. If Uncle Bug had run a background check on Hansen and the Alliance, it might have been normal for him to have learned about Hansen's father and grandfather. But there was no way Uncle Bug should have known Hansen had the Nine Life Cat. Hansen recalled his first meeting with Uncle Bug and how Uncle Bug acted strangely and gave him an odd look. He might have seen Hansen's necklace. But Hansen was wearing armor, so the man shouldn't have been able to sense or see it. This guy must have some connection to Blood Legion and Han Jingji. Hansen would have loved to open his brain and get a proper look at what had been running through his mind. Chapter 1125, Strange Valley Uncle Bug, where are you off to? Hansen asked, looking at Uncle Bug. I'm going to Red Bog Lake to collect some more meat, Uncle Bug answered. You are strong, and you're around the same age as my great-grandfather. Perhaps you met him at some point? It's a shame he's dead now, though. His name is Han Jinji, have you heard about him? Hansen asked, coyly. Uncle Bug gave a strange look at first, but then he smiled, saying, That name eludes me. Sorry. Hansen wished to say something more, but Uncle Bug quickly waved his hand and said, I need to go to Red Bog Lake now. We can talk later. Watching Uncle Bug leave. Hansen knew he had caught the man off guard. Uncle Bug was a little nervous in his response. Hansen wished to find out what had happened in the past, but no one ever wished to talk about it. Not even Sunset could tell him. It was incredibly unlikely but fortunate for him to have met Uncle Bug, and Hansen was fond of the area around the shelter. He knew he couldn't push the old man too hard for information. Not yet. Anyway, how can I get Uncle Bug to reveal more? Hansen wrestled with a number of different methods he could try, but none seemed viable. So, he decided to find out more about who Uncle Bug actually was. People only knew him by the queer nickname, so he fancied trying to dig a little deeper beyond the name Uncle Bug. Hansen even asked someone to compose an image of the man. With his portrait in hand, Hansen perused Skynet to learn more about Uncle Bug's true identity. Unfortunately, he couldn't find a trace of the man. Uncle Bug gave Hansen an uneasy feeling in his stomach, and his mere presence was different than what Hansen received off others. Hansen concluded his investigation with lame results. Nothing new was learned. He hadn't even found the man's real name. Hansen asked the elders in the shelter, who looked to be close with Uncle Bug, but learned nothing from them, either. They spoke a lot, but didn't actually say much, so to speak. Hansen now knew there was something off about the man, but he wasn't sure how he'd get him to talk. Uncle Bug continued to pretend he didn't know anything, upon future inquiries. It was rather frustrating for Hans Sr. 
Hansen's Dongxian Sutra could not follow every train of thought or skin through the mind of a person as if it were an archive. Had he been able to do this, Hansen wouldn't have gone to such lengths to find out info elsewhere. But he knew he had to be careful and not scare Uncle Bug off. If he was too pushy, things could turn ill. What's more, if Hansen ever left the shelter, he wouldn't know where to find him back in the Alliance. Hansen decided to drop the investigation for now and resume his previous plan of heading for the strange valley he had been told about. He went there with Bauer. Finding a super creature in the forest of a thousand insects was a very difficult affair, as the knotted realm was rather tame compared to other regions if one did not venture too far. Hansen went to the deserted area and saw the three hills, which acted as a crude border wall separating the forest of a thousand insects and thorn forest. The hills were not too tall and they stood at a height of around 500 meters. They were quite plain and barren. Hansen flew into the sky to get an aerial view of the space. As he had been told, there was a Y-shaped valley devoid of any visible life. It was like a dead canyon, cloaked in white sand. He wouldn't believe it was entirely empty, however. Giving the place a scan, his suspicions were confirmed. He found something. In that valley were numerous holes. They were all the size of a fist, roughly, and looked like little tunnels that belonged to a nest. Hansen's Dongshten aura could not see through the thick walls, unfortunately, so he could not get a proper scan of what might lay inside. He did hear a noise, though. He wasn't entirely sure what the noise was, but he acknowledged it wasn't too dissimilar to the crying of a baby. Uncle Bug had told him about the noise, but Hansen was still surprised to hear it just as he said. And he could hear it from quite a distance away, too. Whatever creature is making that sound, it seems as if it resides beneath here. I'll have to draw it out somehow. Hansen had an idea of how to do just that. So, he returned to the forest and caught two tank bugs. Hansen cut each of them up and tossed them into the valley. The two tank bugs had not been killed. They had just been badly injured. They squirmed around in agony, trying to escape the place as blood squirted everywhere. Watching the bugs leave the valley, another thought cropped into Hansen's head. Are those creatures not interested in the tank bugs? As Hansen thought about this, the tank bugs were successfully making their escape. Or so it seemed. The tank bugs were only 10 meters away from the exit. But then, they just vanished. The trail of blood they had left in their wake stopped in the exact spot they disappeared from sight. Stranger still, it didn't look as if something had pulled them down into the sand. The two bugs just vanished before Hansen's eyes, with no warning or indication of where they had gone. Hansen had already activated his Dongshan aura, so if something peculiar had happened, he should have noticed it. But the two injured tank bugs suffered a fate that made no sense. Hansen gritted his teeth and flew back into the forest again. He grabbed a few more bugs, wounded them, and tossed them into the valley. This time, Hansen focused on them intently. He wanted to watch where they went exactly. He had tossed in ordinary and primitive class creatures, and they looked to be panicky and desperate. They urgently wished to escape the valley. Chapter 1126 Human Face Scorpion Hansen's pupil shrank as he saw three of the bugs vanish. With no indication of another creature or unexpected movement, they disappeared right in front of his eyes. The other two bugs tried to make themselves scarce, but it wasn't long before they were taken by the phantom that seemed to plague those sands. What is this? Hansen looked over to where they disappeared and scanned the area. There was nothing to be seen. Again, five bugs had just immediately gone missing. Are there any cracks in the space of this place? Maybe they slipped into another dimension or something. Hansen was shocked by what was going on. Hansen was glad that he had not wandered into the valley himself. But, wanting another look, Hansen went away to collect more bugs. When he had a few more, he tossed them down towards the sands below. The results were mostly the same, though. This time, Hansen scattered the bugs all around, but they all still vanished. They were able to disappear from any corner of that valley, and not in just one spot. Hansen spent more time conducting these tests, tossing dozens and dozens of bugs each time. Despite his best efforts to uncover what was going on, he was as clueless as when he began. His crack in space theory seemed unlikely, too, given that the bugs could disappear from anywhere. If there was a rip in space, it would most likely take the form of a single large hole. Although it was difficult to detect the presence of cracks in space, Hansen's keen eyesight should have allowed him to notice the slight shimmering they often gave off. With no other clues or ideas about what might have been happening, the thought still weighed on his mind. 
He didn't dare go to the valley himself, though. Hansen remained above, watching from the top of a hill in safety. Eventually, the stars rose and the moon gleamed brightly above the land. Despite the hours spent there, Hansen wasn't able to deduce anything. The region he was situated in was eerily silent, but he remained there stubbornly. He peered into every nook and cranny of that place, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever was causing that peculiar phenomenon. Unfortunately for him, he learned nothing. If there was a creature lurking beneath those sands, how could it have snatched the bugs without a trace? As Hansen's mind wandered, a rustle in the trees startled him. Hansen looked into the forest that was a distance away and saw a man appear. It was Uncle Buck. Hansen was shocked, not expecting to see Uncle Bug casually approach the valley on foot. He said it was dangerous to come here. He warned me to stay away. Why is he coming here himself? Hansen frowned. Uncle Bug was carrying a sack, and something seemed to be wriggling inside. Hansen tried to determine what it was through a scan. All he could learn was that it was alive, and that it possessed a life force. Uncle Bug approached the entrance of the valley and stopped. He peered across the sands of that place and tossed the bag onto the sands below. Uncle Bug was strong, clearly. The sack was large, the size of a human. Despite that, he was able to toss it an entire kilometer. Whatever was in the sack looked to be panicking, and it thrashed around frantically after it came crashing down to the ground. Unfortunately, it had been sealed tight, and whatever was inside could not escape. Hansen looked at the bag and thought to himself, What is inside that? Is he doing what I did? Is he trying to uncover what lurks inside this valley, too? All of a sudden, Hansen heard the sound of a baby crying once more. It was incredibly sharp, just like Uncle Bug had told him. It was unnerving and unsettling. The baby's sound was as if it had been traumatized. Hansen then realized the sound was coming from the holes he had examined earlier. In that Y-shaped valley, the holes were emitting the sound of a shrieking baby-like speakers. The only unclear thing was which hole the noise was coming from. Quickly, Hansen received his answer. After he listened closer, he realized that each and every hole was making the noise. Then, something even creepier occurred. Countless scorpions began to pour out of the holes. Thousands of the critters began to cascade from the sandy orifices, all heading for the bag and whatever was inside it. The scorpions were about the same size of a fist. They were black, but without sheen. On their backs was the faint picture of a human face. It was like that of a baby, giving off a creepy, devilish smile. When the scorpions moved, the smile looked like it was living and moving. It totally creeped Hansen out. The scorpions did not look strong, but they were scary enough to make Hansen feel frightened. When Hansen mustered the courage to scan them, he learned they were just mutant creatures. But since they were all mutant creatures, even that group was a force to be reckoned with. Hansen's only question was why they all came out when Uncle Bug threw down a prize. What is he up to? Hansen looked at the scorpions and wondered. Eventually, the human-faced scorpions reached the sack. Then, whatever was inside managed to roll out. Chapter 1127 A Man Who Wants to Die When Hansen saw what emerged from the sack, his body flared with goosebumps and his head got all itchy. The person that emerged from the bag was a man who was very skinny and seemed to be around 30 years of age. It was a living person, and Hansen could see the fright that twisted his face. Before Hansen could return from his thoughts, the scorpions were stinging the poor man. He was stung many times, like he was being deliberately tortured. He rolled around on the ground, writhing and screaming in agony. It is all a ruse. How can Uncle Bug feign such kindness every day? when this is the sick and twisted stuff he gets up to on his own. How could he even think to torture a man like that? Hansen's spine was frosting over with the chills he was feeling. When Hansen next looked at Uncle Bug, he froze. Uncle Bug was crying. As he watched the man get stung all over, he himself looked as if he was in pain. Amidst the tears, he prayed over the man down below. It was then that Hansen realized the man being tortured looked familiar, like someone he had seen in the shelter. Uncle Bug was being very emotional. Hansen used Dong Shin Aura to get a read of the man's feelings and see what he could hear of the man's thoughts. But all he could hear was screaming. There was one word he was able to discern, though. Son? Did he say son? That can't be his son. Hansen exclaimed in his head as he turned to look at the naked man. He couldn't even begin to fathom why Uncle Bug would treat his son in such a manner. But people wouldn't lie to themselves in such a situation. He had heard Uncle Bug scream it was his son. Hansen could not have been mistaken. 
Now, the body of the person on the ground was all swollen. The natural assumption would be to presume he was dead, or was going to be, in such a state. He had been a rather skinny man when Hansen first saw him. Now, he was swollen like a fat man. The man could no longer scream, but his muscles still twitched with the pain he was continuing to endure. Uncle Bug continued to pray as tears drenched his face. As he did so, his teeth chattered in what had to be fear. Hansen had never seen anything as remotely curious, horrific, and upsetting as this. He had no idea how he should feel about what was going on. Just as Hansen thought the man was about to be dined on, he heard the baby cry again. It wasn't sharp like before. The sound of the baby was rough and coarse. When the noise echoed across the valley, all the scorpions returned to their holes. Soon enough, all that remained was a man who looked much like a bloated pig. Uncle Bug looked at the dying man in the valley. Hansen was keen to know what had happened, why this was happening, and what was to happen. He was sweating with nervousness. This entire scenario seemed bizarre. When Hansen looked at the man, he noticed his shadow appeared to be strangely large. The man was like a pig, but there was no way his shadow was three meters tall. The shadow was very weird. Half of it looked like a man, and the other half looked like a scorpion. The shadow came to life and moved. A person with long black hair and eyes that were as black as coal emerged. His muscles were thick and ripped beneath the black armor he was clad in. The man's lower body was a scorpion, and the transition from man to scorpion was seamless. Hansen looked at the scorpion man, feeling his life force to be even greater than disloyal knights. Why would this guy's shadow be a super creature? Hansen wondered as he looked at the scorpion man. The scorpion man then waved his tail and plunged it into the chest of the corpse on the ground. Then, the body quickly became slimmer. The man's body returned to normal as all the stinging fluids went into the tail of the scorpion man. Then, after that, the man stood up. He looked very energized. When the man stood up, he walked towards the scorpion man angrily. When he was in front of the scorpion man, the scorpion man became that man's shadow. The man fell to the ground, throwing his fist against his own shadow. It looked like he was just punching the sand. The man's hands bled as they beat against the ground, but he did not seem as if he wanted to stop. Little Yin, Uncle Bug ran towards the man, wanting to hug him. When the man turned around, though, Uncle Bug stopped his approach. I will hate you forever. The man looked furious. The man stood up, picked up a rock, and tried to slam it into his own head. But before he could do that, a shadow touched the rock, causing it to explode. He couldn't kill himself. Chapter 1128 Uncle Buck. The man tried his hardest to kill himself, repeatedly. But each and every time, the shadow stopped him. Uncle Bug was crying again, with a face that was full of regret and pain. The man had been savagely injured, but he couldn't be free and allow himself to die. Little Yen, stop this. Uncle Bug guiltily pleaded. What did you expect? Is this what you wanted me to become? The man angrily responded. In continued tears, Uncle Bug exclaimed, I didn't want to but you were sick. It said it would fix you. I didn't expect. Uncle Bug's tears did not relent. He fixed me, and I am not dead. The man was laughing, but it was a laughter of hysteria. This was worse than him crying. I am sorry, Uncle Bug said. The man, who was laughing like a madman, responded, you are not. You made me suffer something that was worse than being killed. Uncle Bug grabbed his own hair, all the while crying. If I knew this was going to happen, I wouldn't have. Uncle Bug's dialogue disintegrated into incoherent mumbling and babbling. The man looked at Uncle Bug, saying, This is my life. His words were coaxed with desperation and sadness. After a while, the sun began to rise. And as it did, the man said, If you continue to believe I am your son, find someone to kill me. I would rather be dead. Little Yin. Uncle Bug looked at the man in profound sadness, but as he did, the man fell to the ground. Hansen was surprised at the sudden turn of events. He was still alive, just unconscious. Uncle Bug used a bag to pick the man up, and then turned to leave the area. If Hansen described what had happened to someone who hadn't seen it with their own eyes, they'd think he was off his rocker. Hansen quickly followed after Uncle Bug to see where he was off to. Hansen thought it might have something to do with the god that Sunset had mentioned. Perhaps by following, he could learn more and uncover the mystery at long last. Uncle Bug took the man back through the forest to nest shelter, though. Then, he took the man to his room. Hansen waited outside the room. 
It wasn't until the next day that Uncle Bug emerged, acting as if nothing had occurred. He issued commands and went back to his usual duties, telling others to hunt, and so on. Uncle Bug, there is something I need to ask you. Privately, if I may, Hansen asked Uncle Bug. There is no need for privacy. Just tell me here, and I'll help you out. Uncle Bug smiled, acting his usual self. But Hansen then implored, I really must speak to you alone about this. Uncle Bug sighed and took Hansen to a place outside the shelter. Little Han, tell me what's the matter. If it is within my capacity to help, I will, Uncle Bug said as he lit up a cigarette. Do you know anything about the Secret Service's seventh team? Hansen asked. Uncle Bug casually shook his head, asking, What is that? Do you know Han Jinji? Hansen then asked. Uncle Bug responded, Your great-grandfather is Han Jinji. He must be a great man if you keep mentioning him. Hansen then said, Then you must know Sunset. Uncle Bug looked at Hansen strangely, clearly not expecting such a response. He told him, I must be getting too old. I don't remember a person called Sunset. Then you must know little Yin, Hansen said. Uncle Bug's body shivered. He stiffened himself up, telling Hansen, I haven't heard of anyone going by these names. You forgot what you wished for? Hansen said mockingly. After that, Uncle Bug's composure changed. He suddenly looked like an angry lion, and he exclaimed, Who are you? Hansen could feel Uncle Bug's life force, and he could tell the man was the greatest and most powerful surpasser he had ever known. Surpassers these days never came close to the heights of Uncle Bug. At his age, it was a surprise to see him have such a high fitness. Humans did not max out their genes back when Uncle Bug had been in his prime, so it was quite the surprise to see how powerful the old man had become. Do you really not know who I am? I told you the name of my great-grandfather. Hansen looked at Uncle Bug. That is impossible. He cannot have had an heir, Uncle Bug said. Why not? Everyone can make babies, Hansen casually responded. But he, Uncle Bug, suddenly stopped. His rage returned before he spoke again, and he blurted out, How dare you try and trick me? I asked you a question first. Who are you? If you don't tell me, you'll have to excuse my ruthless actions. Chapter 1129 Hansen's guess. Seeing Uncle Bug's murderous look, Hansen could now see how cruel of a person he must have really been. Hansen sighed, unsure whether or not he'd be able to pluck more information from him. Thinking this, he decided to tell him, Uncle Bug, I was in that valley the other night. Uncle Bug's grimace turned to visible shock as he stared at Han Sr. That was your son, wasn't it? I think I can help. This was Han Sin's one and only trump card. If he wanted the information he sought, this was the only way. Uncle Bug still looked to be fuming with anger, but he asked, How do you know Sunset? I met her. Hansen proceeded to tell Uncle Bug about his encounter with her, inside the crystallizer ruins. Uncle Bug, after hearing what he was told, had a complex look fall across his face. He said, She still decided on living forever young. So, were you really a member of the seventh team? What happened? Hansen asked. Uncle Bug said, it is none of your business. If you pursue this matter any further, it'll only lead to ruin. Don't get yourself killed over all this. If that is so, do you need me to remind you about your son? Do you want him to remain in such a condition? I can help him. Hansen knew the man would still be a little too stubborn to elucidate. Uncle Bug shook his head, saying, just go. And don't breathe a word about this to anyone else. If you do, you're dead. Hansen didn't move though. He remained and told Uncle Bug. You are very strong, but even you cannot deal with the creature in the shadow. No one can deal with it, Uncle Bug said with a wry smile. I can't, Hansen said. Hansen knew it was a powerful super creature, but he still believed he could defeat it with the aid of disloyal knight. The only thing Hansen did not know was the relationship between the man and the creature. He had to learn more about that. With another wry smile, Uncle Bug said, You have no idea what that thing is. It is only a super creature. It is not some elaborate secret, Hansen Darley said. Uncle Bug responded, No single human can beat super creatures in the third gods. Sanctuary. I'm not just anyone, Hansen said. Uncle Bug wished to say something more, but suddenly, Hansen's back was blazing with a bright fire. Wings were outstretched, transforming him into a big fiery bird. Is that a super shape-shifting beast soul? Uncle Bug gasped with surprise. Hansen returned to his human form and said, so, what do you think? Do I have what it takes? 
Uncle Bug looked at Hansen and said, You are special. I'll give you that. But shape-shifting beast souls can be draining, and you don't have an infinite amount of time to use it. Well, what about with this guy by my side? Hansen then summoned Disloyal Knight, a super pet beast soul with battle mode. Uncle Bug was incredibly shocked by this. Even if I was unable to defeat the creature, I could bring your son everlasting peace, Hansen said, peering into Uncle Bug's emotional reaction. Uncle Bug bore a complicated look, one that was a mixture of excitement and confusion. His lips trembled when he asked, What do you want from me? I want to know what transpired in that other dimension, the one spoken of by Sunset. And I want to know why everyone keeps saying Han Jinji could not have had an heir. Hansen gave his terms. To this, Uncle Bug said, If you can help little Yin, I will tell you everything. Then it is settled. But it would be best if you tell me what happened to your son, first, and tell me exactly what I'm dealing with here. I will do my best to kill the creature without harming your son, if such a thing is possible, Hansen kindly said. Uncle Bug looked touched upon hearing this, and he said, Little Yan's mother bore the same sickness. He is what she had. There was no cure, and his mother passed away. The same fate was to soon befall Little Yin. Uncle Bug told him most of the story. Hansen was able to fill in the blank spots himself. Uncle Bug said that he had learned of a way in which he could save his son. It was a method in which you could sign a contract and bind your life to that of a creature. They could live together, sharing energy. Uncle Bug convinced his son to sign such a contract, and his son did indeed live. But unfortunately, his son was too weak to share his life with the creature, and now, he was being entirely controlled by it. Little Yin was in a vegetative state, only waking up once a month. What Hansen had witnessed was him traveling to the valley to absorb scorpion poison and feed the super creature that lived inside him. If Uncle Bug did not take him to the valley, he'd be in even more agony than that which he suffered at the stings of the scorpions. His fate truly was worse than death. Although he had avoided death, he was most certainly not living. He was hardly human, and he had suffered this fate for 100 years. Hansen felt a shiver run down his spine when he imagined what it must have felt like to exist in such a state. Hansen had never heard of such a method being employed before, though, and he believed it might have had some connection to the seventh team accessing the dimension that Sunset had told him about. He had been able to come to the third god's sanctuary and sign a contract with a super creature. No ordinary human could do such a thing, not through ordinary means. But these were just guesses and thoughts Hansen had, and he wasn't sure if they were correct. Chin Huizhen, Sunset, and Uncle Bug all claimed to have seen a figure that proclaimed itself to be God in that dimension. Perhaps that God was a being that said it could fulfill their wishes. Qin Huizhen may have wished to live forever, so he was frozen in place. But still that only led to death and did not make him immortal. Perhaps Sunset wanted to be young forever, so she was placed inside that vase to remain like so. When she was exposed to the elements outside that sturdy vase, that age caught up with her and she died. Uncle Bugs' wish may not have applied to himself. It could have been to save his son, but even those results turned sour. If Hansen's hypothesis was correct, and that really was God, Hansen thought he was an asterisk shoal. Don't worry, I'll do my best to take down that super creature, Hansen said. Chapter 1130 Invisible Creature Killing the super creature he had proposed to slay would not be easy. Uncle Bug told him the shadow of the creature was what possessed his son but the actual body he would have to defeat was someplace in the valley. Hansen thought about the bugs he had thrown down into the valley, the ones that disappeared, and wondered whether or not they were related to the creature he was preparing to defeat. Hansen returned to the valley, bringing many bugs with him. He perched himself atop the hill like he had before and tossed a few bugs down into the valley every now and again. Just like before, the bugs would try to scurry away but then get snatched by some unseen force. They just vanish into thin air. Hansen kept chucking the bugs into the same spot and noticed the bugs only disappeared when they reached a certain point. That proved there were no space cracks, as space cracks could not move. If there are no space cracks, then that means it must be a super creature. But if so, how can it make these bugs disappear so easily? Hansen thought hard about what may have been the crux of the issue. Whatever was going on, his Dongshin aura was not able to detect any creatures down there. Being unable to determine the nature of the threat made Hansen far more cautious than usual. Hansen remained on the hill for a few days, watching and waiting to see what he could. If there was a creature lurking beneath the sands, he wanted to see it. 
Hansen watched the shadows of the bugs intently, wanting to see if there were any disruption before they disappeared. It was a fine idea, but did not provide him the answers he sought. Nothing was assaulting the bugs from within their own shadows. In the midst of all these uncertainties, one thing was for sure. It was a scary super creature, and Hansen had yet to gauge how powerful it might have been. A lack of intel was one of the most dangerous things when attempting to fight a foe. But whatever the case may have been, it looked to Hansen that there were two possibilities. First, the creature itself was invisible. Or second, the powers of the super creature were invisible. If it's the second possibility, I should have no problems dealing with it. If it's the first possibility, I'll need to watch myself. That'd be tough, Hansen thought to himself. If it was a creature that the Dongshin aura could not even detect, it had to be an absurdly powerful monster. Due to Hansen's desire for caution, he remained there for another 15 days. Unfortunately, despite all the time that had elapsed, he still had zero concrete intel on the creature he would have to face. If he didn't want the secret of Han Jinji and Seventh Team, he wouldn't even think about fighting such a creature. You only live once. Every strike could be fatal, so Hansen needed to know he could get a handle on whatever he would face when he confronted the creature. And Hansen really wanted to know what had happened with the Seventh Team and why Han Jinji humiliated God as Sunset had told him. And also, why Qin Huijin had told him to be wary of Han Jinji. Han Sen had been collecting breadcrumbs for this entire affair for a long time, and he was desperate for the full story. The knowledge was within his reach, so he had to commit to what he had pledged to do for Uncle Buck. If he did this, he would finally know everything he wished to. That night, Hansen heard a baby crying once more. Uncle Bug said he had to bring his son there once a month, so it wasn't time yet. This made Hansen a little wary, and he wondered why there'd be movement now. The human-faced scorpions came out, covering every inch of that valley in their thick and wriggling heights. It was disgusting. If there were space cracks there, scorpions would have slipped in no doubt. This frightening sight certainly put that theory to bed. Their movement drew Hansen's attention, and he watched intently as they all began to congregate in the center of the Y-shaped valley. A curious view, as there did not appear to be anything of particular interest in that spot. Eventually, their congregation began to spread and form a circle. They left the very center spot open. Hansen stared at the space they had left open and noticed something. The moonlight was extra bright on this night, due to it being a full moon. The moonlight began to illuminate the oily hides of the scorpions, making the faces on their backs seem alive. When the light hit the spot they had left open, it was as if the light was striking an invisible wall. It seemed to collect and form a faint outline. Hansen's eyes opened wide, as more and more light gathered to form a faint figure. Eventually, Hansen was able to see the shape of a half-man, half-scorpion creature that was identical to the one that plagued Uncle Bug's son. But whereas the shadow variant he had seen with Uncle Bug's son was pitch black, this one was transparent. If it wasn't for the moonlight illuminating it, Hansen didn't think he'd have been able to see it at all. But even though Hansen could see it with his naked eyes, the Dongshin aura still proved ineffective. He still couldn't get a feel for the life force of the scorpion. The fact that the transparent scorpion seemed to be capable of eluding the Dongshin aura was a frightening thing to think about. This guy is invisible, Hansen frowned. This was the worst possible result he could have. Maybe it would be best for me to strike now, while I can still see it. Hansen stared at it, thinking of how he'd begin his engagement with the beast. But eventually, Hansen decided against fighting it. He remained there, watching the invisible scorpion, absorbing the moonlight that had been channeled through the bright reflections of the little scorpion's chitin. This went on for one hour, and when the moon began its descent, the reflection subsided. And then, the faint outline of the scorpion man-beast went with it.